Welcome to the Independent Advisors Podcast, where we dive into the world of stocks, tradable markets, and financial planning with Jessup Wealth Management's Chief Investment Officer, Mark McEvely, and CEO, Matt Jessup. You'll hear tips, tricks, and strategies to address your financial well-being, and most importantly, conveyed in a way that everyone can understand. Here are your hosts, Mark and Matt. Hey everyone, welcome to episode number 210 of the Independent Advisors Podcast, where Matt Jessup and I, Mark McEvely, bring you everything you need to know from the past week in the world of financial markets and financial planning. How are you, Matt? I'm doing good, Mark. How about yourself? Good. Hope everyone is enjoying the start to their summer, and uh, I know some parts of the country, kids are out of school. Other parts of the country, kids should just be getting out of school, so are the kids enjoying summer so far? They're loving every day. Staying up late, sleeping in. This morning I was told my oldest, who is 11, Rachel had to go into his room at 11.30. Wow. Sleeping in. Sleeping in. <clears throat> Already starting the early teenage years, Mark. There you go. Yep. Yeah, I remember those days. Yep. It was nice. Not a care in the world, right? Not a care in the world. Uh, all right, Matt. This week we're just going to hop right into it. Uh, talk about some tweets, articles, and research that me and you have come across. So, all right. Uh, first thing I have is a quote from Todd Sohn, who is a strategist at Strategas. Okay. Um, and this was the quote. When perception diverges from reality, it creates opportunity for us as financial market participants. How true is that? It's very true. And I think the most recent examples or the easiest examples, that at least I can think of, are COVID, mm-hmm. where perception diverged from reality quite a bit. Yep. Um, and AI. Yes. And I think in both instances, people thought that life was just going to change forever and how we know it. And while life did change uh, for a short amount of time during the COVID uh, lockdowns, we're back to normal now. Right. And I think it's easy when we're in it, in the thick of it, like we were in March of 2020. It's hard to see past it and That's see right. how we're going to get past it. That's right. Um, but. We're still standing. The The earth is still spinning, uh, to my knowledge. So I think there's going to be several more instances of this over the next several decades. And we just have to remember that uh, as hard as it may seem to look past it, more likely than not, we're, we're going to get through it. Yeah. And it also makes me uh, very memorable about 2022, Mark, you know, especially in the depths of the lows in October. The feeling was there's no way the Fed can raise interest rates to the magnitude they did and not cause a deep, bad, bad recession, right? And that's the only tunnel vision for the most part that the market had. And that didn't happen so far. Right. And, you know, the the talk of at least the past couple of months has been AI, artificial intelligence. Been the hot topic in the market. And I think people have this fear that um, it's going to create significant job loss. Um, it's going to be dangerous and that life is going to change as we know it. But, um, you know, in my opinion, it's just another piece of technology and a part of our evolution as human beings that the more and more as time goes on, we're going to continue to get more technologically advanced. And you think back to the early 2000s when the Internet came about or the late 90s when the Internet came about, um, you know, at that time, people thought that the internet was life-changing, right? Mm -hmm. But now it's just like, okay, this is something that we've had for a long time. And I think the best example for me is, you know, I was reading some articles about this and when Excel came out, people thought that that was just going to change the world and that, you know, the computers were going to do everything. And while Excel is one of the best pieces of technology that's ever been created, in my opinion, you still need a human to, to use it correctly, That's right. right? That's right. Um, and, and I know, again, it doesn't, it seems like AI is something that's way greater than that. But I think in 20 years, we're going to be talking about a new form of technology that's even better than AI. Well put. You know, the, the thing you've said before on this podcast multiple times that makes me think is technology innovation is one of the biggest deflationary factors that is not talked about enough, especially over the past three decades. Right. You know, you've mentioned that multiple times in this podcast, and that's very, very true. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, I think it's no different from 
you know, new technologies and investing in the market is uh, what's the most common phrase? This it's, time it's, it's different. different. This time, yeah. But I I would lean to say that uh, it's not going to be. So that's right. Uh, second item I had was a tweet from Kelly Cox on June 9th. She always has good stuff. Yeah, Kelly is uh, uh, an analyst at eToro. Um, and Jenna's going to throw this up on the YouTube video for our listeners, and it'll be in our show notes resources. But it's a graph of the history of bull and bear markets. Okay. So um, in this graph, uh, bull markets are defined as a 20% rise from a 52-week low in the S&P 500, and a bear market is defined as a 20% fall from the 52-week high in the S&P 500. And this just goes to show you, Matt, that number one, bull markets last way longer than bear markets. Very much so. And number two, markets go up a lot more than they go down. It's interesting that you picked this piece from Cali because I have something similar. Shocking. <laughs> Jenna's shocked over here. It's similar because people need to be reminded of this because people's hands are still burnt from the stove from 2022. Right. And so people are hesitant to grab that pot again. Right? Right. And you got to realize that over a longer period of time, there's a lot more up years than it is down years, and that's part of investing. It's why you get the returns you get, is it's not nice and even every single day. Right, yeah, exactly. Quick divergence from what we're talking about here, but um, my wife just had her uh, baby shower recently here in Dayton. Correct. And uh, I thought it was funny that, you know, just because you and I pick similar topics to talk about similarly on the same dates, uh, we did a little game, me and Kenzie at the baby shower, and people got points for getting questions right about us. And guess who came in first in the baby shower and going back a couple of years ago at uh, our wedding shower, Rachel Jessup won <laughs> both games because she knows me so well. And I looked at Rachel, and I was like, how many did you get right? And she was like, 20 out of 20. And she was like, but come on, it's like a cheat code. You and Matt are the same person. <laughs> She's so right. <laughs> Is she right? <laughs> She's right. She's very right. She's right. So I uh, just thought I'd throw that out there for people. People but, are going to love that. Um, I, I really do encourage people, if you're not watching this on YouTube, to, to go ahead and check out the show notes on this because it really is quite dramatic um, and should give people more it's comfort. It's a polarizing image. Yeah, very polarizing. Should, should uh, give people more comfort if they have hesitations right now. Good, right? good way of saying it. Uh, last thing I had, Matt, was a tweet from Michael Kahn, who is a CMT, a Chartered Market Technician, on June 9th. And uh, he tweeted a graph of the S&P 500, and he, all he said was a follow-up to yesterday's tweet, hashtag stupid media. Um, and, and what this shows, Matt, is it's a chart of the S&P 500. And as you can see by looking at this, from January 4th of 2022 uh -huh. to May 12th of 2022, the S&P 500 was down approximately 19%. Yes. And this was technically not a bear market. Missed it, barely. But from May 12th of 2022 through October 13th of 2022, the S&P 500 was down about 9%. Yes. So the thing I want to point out here is the bear market only fell 9% from when it officially, quote unquote, became a bear market until the lows in October. And just as an investment guy, this just doesn't make much sense to me because most of the damage was done, done before it was deemed to a, be a, a bear, bear market. market. And it's the same thing on the other side. When the market rises 20% off the lows, that's a good chunk of, of gains. the gains, right? Um, so again, I, I'm not in the theory of the 20% for a bear and bull market. Other people like to analyze it that way. I do not. Uh, like we said many times before on the show, um, you know, I like uptrends and downtrends, keep it simple. Downtrends are lower lows and lower highs. Uptrends are higher highs and, and higher lows. So um, interesting chart that, that kind of caught my eye. I love it. So I got uh, three items. Um, the first is market corrections are normal. So this is a piece from Mike Zaccardi on June 14th. 
he is showing a chart from the research firm Schroeder's with the data set ending December 31st of 2022, Mark, okay? So for our YouTube viewers, Jenna will put this up. This will be in our show notes. This is a chart of the MSCI World Index, okay? Goes back to 1972. And what it's doing is it's showing the biggest stock market falls in each of the calendar years. Got that? Mm -hmm. So the past 50 years, Mark, we've had 29 times where the market has sold off more than 10% in a calendar year. From that's a high water mark? Correct. Yeah. And that's 58% of all years. Okay? So let's round up to 60. Mm -hmm. So 60% of the time, you're going to get a correction during the year of at least 10%. Okay? Very, very normal. 13 of those times, the market sold off more than 20% in a calendar year. So that's 26% of the time. So one-fourth every four years, statistically in the world index, you're going to sell off at least 20% at some point. Okay? I like this data set because even with those stats, as you pointed out about the Cali Cox piece, it still shouldn't get you out of the market as long as you have the proper time horizon, goals and objectives, and risk tolerance for those assets. That's why I picked this. Yeah, I think it's it's really good, uh, especially for people that might be uh, timid or, or scared. Um, you know, every year, you know, we expect at least a 10% pullback. At least at some point during the year. At some point during the year. So I don't, you know, the next time the market sells off by 10%, I think it's it's going to feel bad. And people, since we're so close to 2022, only, you know, six months re removed from 2022, people are going to be like, oh my gosh, this is another 20 to 30% correction. Yep. And it might be, but it may not necessarily be the case. And if we only get 10 or 10 to 12%, it's very normal and people shouldn't be freaking out. Love that you said that. You're playing perfectly into my second note I want to share. Okay. So my second note I want to share is a blog post by our friend Ben Carlson on June 13th. The title of his blog post, Mark, is, quote, this is why you stay the course. I mean, am I following up you perfectly right here? It's great. Okay. He just writes content for this, for this podcast. He does a great job. Okay. So this is what he wrote. I'm going to paraphrase and pick a couple of pieces that I think are going to be pertinent to our audience. The first is a chart of some of the worst years for the S&P 500 index. Jenna will put this up. You're going to see a data set mark of about a baker's dozen uh, years, 1930, 31, 37, 40, etc. And what he shows is the next year, it tends to be kind of a feast or famine scenario. Just because you have a bad year doesn't necessarily guarantee the next year is going to be higher. And this data set proves that, right? But the point that he's making is that over a period of time, the market does really, really good. Okay. Now he's pointing this out because at the end of last year, the amount of pessimism in the market, the overwhelming view by Wall Street was quite bearish. And this is what he's alluding to. He shows this post from Sam Rue, which shows S&P 500 index year end 2023 targets. These were published at the end of last year, sir of 16 of Wall Street's biggest firms. This is gonna get you going, okay? Because it was in vogue to be pessimistic at the end of last year. If you were bullish, you were ridiculed at the end of last year. Correct. Okay? So what you're gonna see is most firms were thinking the S&P was gonna end this year somewhere in the avenue of about 4,000. The lowest estimate was Barclays uh, for the index at uh, 3,675. And the most bullish was Deutsche Bank at 4,500, okay? And if you would have took the advice so far this year from the consensus of Wall Street, we're well above 4,400 or so on the S&P right now, 
Yeah, that's what I was I was looking at. We're around like you know the forty three, forty four hundred level, right? And so this is his words of wisdom. This is where the rubber hits the road. Are you ready? Quote. This is why I'm such a big proponent of having an investment plan that you can stick with through a wide range of market and economic environments. Staying the course means going against your own emotions at times. Staying the course means thinking and acting for long term, even when it doesn't feel right in the short term. Staying the course means preparing, not predicting. And staying the course means doing nothing when that's what your plan calls for. Unfortunately, Doing nothing is hard work because markets are constantly tempting you to make changes to your portfolio. Mm -hmm. And that's where, you know, and again, I don't want to beat a dead horse because we've talked about it so many times, but that's where people get into trouble is they get this overwhelming feeling that they need to be doing something in every type of market environment, especially when the market's going down. Mm -hmm. Um, Or on the other side, when there's an individual stock that is just taking a rocket ship to the moon that doesn't seem like it can go down. They jump in and typically it tends to be too late and that's the top, right? When your friends are talking to you about it, when the taxi driver's talking to you about it, when your Uber driver's talking to you about it, it's already too late. Water cooler talk tends to be a top. Right. And you know, the lowest, the lowest price target here from, it looks like it's from Barclays, uh, 3675 that's about 20 percent lower than where we are right now in the s p so for barclays to be right we would have to go into another bear market between now and the end of the year anything Very possible anything's possible but in my opinion unlikely not likely so again you know just be careful of the herd mentality because the herd mentality last year is 2023 is going to be a horrible year the fed's going to cause a deep recession and i've been on that soapbox for a while mm-hmm All right, my last piece is some good news for home builders. There's a really good blog, uh, listeners and viewers, if you're interested about what's going on with real estate, uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Bill McBride. He has got a blog called Calculated Risk. Yeah, it's really good. He focuses on the housing market. He has a real good job. He does like the facts, the analytics behind it. This piece, Mark, is from June 19th. And I'll just briefly quote what he said. Every housing cycle is different. However, I've been arguing, I it, speaking as if I'm Bill, I've been arguing that this cycle wouldn't be anything like the new home market that followed the housing bust and that this recovery be more similar to other previous cycles. Here now he shows a graph. Jenna will put this up for our YouTube viewers. It'll be in our show notes. The graph from previous posts showing new home sales from the Census Bureau for four periods market are similar. 1978 to 1982, 1989 to 1993, 2005 to 2020, and the current is in the red. The prior peak in sales are set to 100. What I like about this is you're getting a lot of people who are fearful or concerned that we are going to replicate the real estate cycle of 08 and 09 with a very long recovery time. And if you just look at the data sets, it doesn't look abnormal to other similar periods compared to it doesn't look relational so far to the great financial crisis. So I want to put some data behind it that to me, this looks like more of a normal housing cycle than the beginning of another horrible multi multi year cycle. Right. Just want to throw it out there. Yeah, no, it's a good piece. Good graph. Back to you. Um, I'll wrap up here, Matt, with uh, the financial planning topic of the week. Um, This came from a blog post from Ryan Holiday outlining uh, 31 lessons he has learned about money. And I just wanted to name a handful here. Please. Okay. And just stop me and let me know if you have any comments on any of these. All right, let's go. So the first one, he says, I've never met a person. I think you'll have some comments on this one. I've never met a person who ever reached their number. You know, people say when I hit... X amount of million, I'll be good. They say, once I have X year's salary in the bank, I'll be good. No one ever seems to get to that number. We're never good because we move the goalposts or because we set a preposterous and unrealistic number to begin with. I think this is extremely accurate up until COVID. I think COVID changed a lot of people's uh, perceptions about what's important to them. And I definitely have seen the goalpost move for many people as they age and get older. 
you know, they see that larger dollar amount, what that means to the lifestyle, the money they can pass on to the next generation. And then obviously, you know, you have these major life disruptions and it makes people do an internal analysis of what's important to them. And um, I think we'll get back to this. You know, once things normalize and the pandemic philosophy kind of dissipates, I think we're gonna get back to where, you know, my goal was X, I got to X, not enough, I want Y. You get to Y, then you're gonna want Z, mm -hmm. right? Right. Um, I am a person where eventually, you know, you have a number and like, okay, all right, this is a number that I'm comfortable with, right? But for most people, the goalpost is gonna continue to change. What do you say about this? Yeah, it's just, it's it's common, it's human nature, right? Yeah. So, you know, you you get to your number and then, you know, for some people, they just wanna set another goal or for some people, they're like, okay, well, I reached this number, but now because I have this and I'm making more money, I'm going to indulge in X, Y, Z, whatever Correct, it is. Sir. It's different for, for everybody. Correct. And, and they're like, well, now that I'm indulge indulging in X, Y, Z, then I just need this amount, which is 10 or 15% more than my yes. original goal. Yes. And, you know, where this comes into play for us is when people have a goal to save for money in the bank, right? Yes. They have a dollar amount that when their head hits the pillow at night, like you always say, they feel comfortable with how much money they have in the bank. Mm hmm that tends to creep up and then they're not contributing as much to their investment accounts or their retirement accounts. And that's where I think people get into the most trouble. That's right. And I use this analogy about 2022 all the time. If you had $100,000 in your savings account at the beginning of 2022, and let's say it had a zero interest rate, at the end of the year, you get a statement for 100 grand. But if that statement showed the purchasing power, X inflation, and it showed you had $92,000 in the account, okay, a purchasing power, do you think a lot of people would actually make a change? They probably would. Probably. Probably yeah. would. Yeah. And I think that that is way people have to really analyze how much they don't have, quote unquote, invested, is you really got to think about what's the purchasing power on that? What's the goal of this money? And I've seen people hold dramatically large amounts of cash on the sidelines for years and years and years and miss out on a lot of opportunity cost. Yeah, absolutely. That's an idea for a new technology that someone can implement and link with banks. What's the the real value, the inflation adjusted mm. value of my money in the bank? That would be interesting. Ooh, I like that. Uh, the second thing is pick the low hanging fruit. I've had to remind the daily stoic employees several times to be sure to sign up for their 401k and matching that we offer. I've left money for too long in checking accounts when the easiest of transfers would have significantly increased the interest I was earning. Don't get overwhelmed by the whole, by the whole of life. The Stoics would say, do easy things first. Absolutely. Figure out what your match is. If you're still working, figure out what at least what you got to contribute to maximize the match from your employer. A lot of times people will say to me, Hey Matt, what do you think the magic number I need to get up to? And if you're not at a 10% savings rate, start raising your 401k savings by 1% a year until you get to that 10%. That seems to be a magic number, very broad recommendation, of course. Yeah. But one-tenth should be something you aspire to over time. Agreed. Third thing he had was, I had this idea that I wanted to be a millionaire by 25. Where this number came from, I don't know. I made it up, it was ego, and I didn't hit it. But you know what the difference of getting there a little late was? Nothing. No one throws you a party, accomplishments don't change who you are accurate accurate uh next thing be responsible have a life insurance policy i have money saved if something happens to me the people i care about will be taken care of absolutely i know there's a website that uh, you've even showed me before that kind of does a life needs analysis it does at the end of the day you got to think about this if you are still in your working ages you got to gap your income making ability between how old you are and when you're planning to retire. And for a lot of people, it could be like 10 to 15 times your annual compensation is what you need in life insurance, right? right. And there's cost effective ways to get this though, you know, and there's so much accessibility. You have a trusted property and casualty agent. There's tons of sites where you can do searches on term insurance. So I definitely think it's an area where most younger people are way underinsured, and generally speaking, a lot of older individuals are overinsured. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Every couple of years, it's good to, to look at insurance for sure. Yeah. Uh, next thing he had was anticipate the fact that maintaining discipline is hard. Automate. I'm always amazed when I check the balances of accounts where we've set up automatic transfers for investing, 
for our kids' college, for our emergency reserves. The things I set up a long time ago have been doing their job a far better job than I would have done had I put it on my monthly to-do list. Did and you write that piece? I Did know. Did you write this that is, specific yeah, one? I know. It sounds like Mark McEvely. Very similar thinking. Yeah, it's just, it takes the friction out of it, right? We want to- wrote that part, Jenna. We want We want to make things as- uh, frictionless as possible. And one way to do that is to automate. I mean, you can automate pretty much anything these days, paying your energy bills, paying your mortgage, uh, investing into your 401k, your IRAs. Uh, you know, it's, it's pretty easy to do these and days. And even raising the contribution rate. You know, a lot of 401k yeah. providers, you can go in there and say, once a year on July 1st, raise my contribution savings by 1%. You could automate my plus 1% strategy. Right. It's easy. It's easy. Uh, last but not least, he says, they say that if you think professionals are expensive, try hiring an amateur. This is true in the sense that being cheap or looking for a bargain on services has come back to bite me many times. And I can that attest. That is well said. I can attest to this too. And, and I don't think I'll ever do it again is, you know, when I, I try to quote unquote cheap out on something. I never get the result that I want. Yes. So paying someone for a professional service, although at first it might hurt a little bit up front, typically, you know, you get what you pay for, right? Um, so don't be afraid to spend money to help get things done that you need to get done. Again, if I hadn't said it once, I've said it a billion times on here. For whatever reason, if I were to end up in court, I would hire an attorney because I would have no idea what you I'm doing. You would represent yourself. Right. You know, it's like I can even give you a uh, non-financial relation to our practice, right? We have a tech consulting firm. Most of the time for our practice, our technology runs very smooth. But the reason we have one on retainer is when it happens, we have someone that knows the system, knows the network, and can rectify things very quickly, right? And if I knew that 95% of the time I would be wasting my money, the 5% that I do need it is worth its weight in gold. Right. It's like an insurance policy. That's right. And, you know, when it comes to our world with investing, I mean, most of the time we are dealing with people's life savings, their core liquid net worth. And at the end of the day, they want someone who's going to be proactive, who's going to be watching and, watching and managing that money from a fiduciary lens, not trying to give a commercial for ourselves, but it does justify that you said it perfectly. You know, they say that if you think professionals are expensive, try hiring an amateur. I mean, it's like, that's true. Right. And, you know, another example that I'll provide for this, and I don't mean to sound morbid, but for most people, their family, their spouse and their kids are the most important things in the world to them. Right. Correct. That's the most important thing to you. Right. Correct. So if they're the most important thing to you, don't you want to get your estate plan right? Don't you want to get your life insurance right? Don't you want to make sure that things are going to be taken care of if you're not here? Yeah. And I also see is it's not always, you know, um, the male say in the relationship, but you tend to have one spouse who is financially dominant. Okay. And I want to make sure that that non non-dominant financial spouse, he or she feels comfortable that there's a plan in place. If the dominant financial spouse is is not with us Correct. and that tends to be a real scary time and so that's another topic there that need that's not talked about enough yeah yeah absolutely so uh we'll have uh the link to the full article uh from ryan if you want to look at uh the other 26 or 27 or so that he listed so i thought it was a good article uh anything else matt before we wrap it up here for the week it's kind of in the thick of earning season uh yeah. for for episode 210 so Thick of earnings season. If you see some more bigger moves in some names, it could be earnings related. Correct. Yep. Just because we ended the uh, second quarter of 2023 just a few weeks ago. Yes. So. All right, everybody. Well, thank you for listening to episode number 210 of the Independent Advisors Podcast. Hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Take care, everyone.
Thank you for listening to the Independent Advisors Podcast. If you're interested in hearing more, hit the subscribe button so you can be notified every time a new episode gets released. Feel free to share with friends, family, and follow us on Twitter at Jessup Wealth, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Mark and Matt will continue to share beneficial information on these social media sites. Also, check out the podcast tab on their website. That's www.jessupwealthmanagement.com. There you'll find links to every episode of the Independent Advisors. Have questions or topics you want to discuss on the show? Message us on Twitter, LinkedIn, or send an email with the words questions and topics in the subject line to inquiries at jessupwealthmanagement.com. We'll talk about it right here on the podcast. Certain sections of this commentary may contain forward-looking statements based on reasonable expectations, estimates, projections, and assumptions. Forward-looking statements are not guarantees of future performance and involve certain risks and uncertainties, which are difficult to predict. All indices are unmanaged and are not available for direct investment by the public. Past performance is not indicative of future results. This podcast is provided for general informational purposes only and does not constitute either tax, legal, or financial advice. Although we do go to great lengths to make sure our information is accurate and useful, we recommend you consult a tax preparer, professional tax advisor, financial advisor, or lawyer regarding your specific circumstances. Investing involves risk, including the loss of principal. No strategy can guarantee any objective or goal will be achieved.